الله نحمده نستعينه الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يتع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعسهما فلا يضر إلا نفسه أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين Today inshallah I will be discussing Surah Al-Fatiha and the message that we find in this surah and why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put this dua because the Quran starts with a dua and the rest of the Quran is the answer to the dua so the Quran starts with the dua and then the rest of the Quran is the answer to the dua. So what is that dua that you are asking for the the rest of the Quran? This is the answer. So the rest of the Quran is the answer to this dua. So let me start from beginning and then I will go into uh, details as we get further. There is a hadith of the Prophet in which the Prophet says that when the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Allah responds How Allah responds? It can be in one of the two ways Either Allah answers the to the angels in Mala'ul A'la That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers to the angels and gives them a response to what we're saying or He responds to us and if we have the, you know, the the, like if you have the antenna to receive the answer, then it may be possible. So the Prophet ﷺ said that when the person says Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah says Hamadani Abdi, Hamadani Abdi, my servant has praised me. And then when the servant says Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says He had my servant has. Majadani Rabbi, Majadani Rabbi. My servant has, you know, uh, accepted my mercy. And then Maliki Yomidin, like this, until you say Dina Sirat Al Mustaqim, and Allah says, before that, Allah says, ask what you want, and then Allah says, okay, I will give you what you want. This is Hadith Al Qudsi, and just giving you an idea that when you are reading Fatiha, that you should have in mind that there is a conversation that's taking. However, as far as the verses are concerned, the first verse about Fatiha, there is a difference of opinion if Bismillah is a part of the verse or not part of part of the surah or not part of the surah. Either way, everyone agrees that there are seven ayat, whether you add Bismillah or don't add Bismillah. I don't want to go into the details of this. First verse, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Hamd means praise. And hamd also means ta'ali. Praise and also shukr. So, when you say hamd, you're also thanking Allah. Like when you finish food, you say alhamdulillah. And hamd is also praise, when you want to praise something. But there are many words in Arabic that mean praise. Thana means praise. Madah means praise. Many words in Arabic that mean praise. But the specific meaning hamd, hamd means a well, a praise that is deserved, a deserving praise. It's not like you're just praising somebody and he doesn't deserve it. But this is in fact praise that is deserved. So Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Alhamd, all gratitude, all gratitude and all praise, all positive attributes that can possibly be in any being they are in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Alhamdulillahi, so all Alhamd is for Allah. 
who is Rabbul Alamin, Master of the Universe. Rabb means he's the Lord, Administrator, Administrator, Sustainer, Guardian, Cherisher. Rabb also means the word Murabbi. You take somebody from a small child and you grow him up. So bringing it into maturity. So one of the meanings of Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen would be all praises for Allah who takes the worlds and takes them from their infancy and brings it to its maturity would be one of the meanings. Anyway, the word Alameen has many meanings also. It could mean different dimensions, different worlds. Alam, if you take it to mean Alam as in dimension or worlds like Alamul Jannah, Alamul Nar, Alamul Barzakh, all of these are different dimensions you can say. But alim can also be from the word ilm, which means knowledge. So Rabbul Alameen would mean that Allah is the Lord of all those who have knowledge. But the real lesson in this ayah, Alhamdulillah Rabbul Alameen, is that it's to nurture that feeling. That feeling that anyone asks you in your life, what, how, how are you, Alhamdulillah? How are you doing, Alhamdulillah? No matter what, Alhamdulillah. Things are not good, Alhamdulillah. Things are good, Alhamdulillah. Just all praises to Allah. No matter what, Alhamdulillah. Nurture that emotion. Nurture that feeling. It's not just words, but the idea is that you're hammering those emotions. Remember, Alhamdulillah is not something intellectual. It's nothing to understand. It's just words. It's emotions. So you have to put those seeds of those emotions inside you. So that when you say Alhamdulillah, it actually... Like when somebody gives you something you like, right? And you're like, oh, thank you, really, I really like this. Thank you so much. You gave it to me. I really appreciate it. You're so happy that he did something for you, this person. Same way when you say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, what are you praising Allah for? What is your emotions at that time? That really matters. You have to have a real sense of an emotional response, uh, just like we do to our children or to any anyone that we like. So Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Alhamd, all praises for Allah, and Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, there's a lot to say, but the most important thing that I want to get across today is that if there is a God, because a lot of people have this concept that God must be a dictator. You know, he's out with like a stick, and he wants you to make your mistake, and the minute you make your mistake, he's gonna like zap you, right? So you're gonna stand before Allah on the Day of Judgment and you're gonna, it's gonna be like, oh, you made this mistake? Too bad, I'm God, I'm gonna do something bad to you now. It's not like that, Allah is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Because if you say there is no God, then that's also a state of meaning, meaninglessness. And if you have a God that's a dictator, who is not merciful, then that also is not necessarily a good situation. And if you have a God that's merciful, then that's where you want it to be. I don't want to compare this with Christianity, but in Judaism, the concept of God is that God gets angry. And in Christianity, the concept is that God is love. You've probably all heard of this. But the middle is that he has mercy, and he, his mercy is for the believers, and his justice is for the criminals. If you do wrong, you'll get justice. But if you do good, you get some mercy. This is the, so the justice part is coming after this. So Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, all praises for Allah. Why? Because He is merciful. Because He is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And in addition to being merciful, He is Maliki Yawm al -Din. He is Master of the Day of Judgment. He has a sense of justice and He will establish the justice. So now when you are asking, praising Allah, that He has all the beautiful attributes, then you're praising Allah, you're all merciful. Then you're praising Allah, you're saying Maliki Yawm al By the way, a side point I want to share with you. Some of the scholars, they say that the mother is, the mother has the attribute of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, and the father has the attribute of Maliki Yawm al Because And together they make a wholesome. So then that's praiseworthy, because if you say that Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen is explained by Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim in Maliki Yawm al is one way to look at it. So, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm al Master of the Day of Judgment. Meaning that there is definitely a day of justice. What comes around, what goes around, comes around. You reap what you sow. 
We all know these statements. So anyway, then after saying Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm Al-Deen, then is the main center of the ayah, or the center of the surah, or the, you can say the amud of the surah, the main theme of the surah, which is Iyya Kan Ya'budullah, Iyya Kan Istaeen. Abd means sir, slave. You're Allah's property, Allah owns you. So Iyya Kan Ya'bud. Only to you we are slaves. You only you own us, basically is the intent. We are only your property. You only only you own us. And only you we serve. And only from you we seek help. Because guidance, guidance is a gift from Allah. It can't be, it cannot, you can't get guidance from your mind. Making the right choices in life is a gift from Allah. And especially the kids that are in their 20s, I want to tell you that the most critical time you make decisions in your life is when you're in your 20s. If you make bad decisions in your 20s, you will be suffering for a very long time for the bad decisions you made in your late teens and 20s. If you, like, if you don't do good in school in the 20s, and then you're going to have to pay for it for the rest of your life. So the most critical time, especially in the times that we live in, the most important time is the 20s in terms of getting it right. If you, get a, if you make good decisions in, the, in your teen years and in your 20s, then the rest Allah will make easy. But if you make bad decisions in your teen years and in your 20s, then you're going to be in a lot of difficulty after that. So anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ O oh Allah, we only worship you and only from you we seek help. We have to always keep in mind that guidance is a gift from Allah. It's always possible that any of us can make a wrong choice. For anything, it can be something small. It can be something big. It can be something small. It can be any... You know how many choices we make as human beings every day? We make thousands of choices. And it's not guidance, just, you know, we think that guidance means following the Sharia only in that sense, but it's not just in that sense. But it's about making the right choice, even amongst right choices. For example, you have milk is halal, and coke is halal, and some strawberry shortcake is also halal, but amongst the three that are halal, there's still a better choice. So it's not just about making a halal decision, it's about making the right decision the best choice. So we make choices all our lives. So like for example, if you're praying from Fajr, Fajr, you're asking Allah to guide you to make all the right decisions till Dhuhr. Then from Dhuhr, you're asking Allah to help you make all the right decisions till Asr. From Asr to Maghrib, Maghrib to Isha, like this. <coughs> so every day you're asking Allah subhanahu wa to guide you to make the right decisions. So your life is the decisions you make. Your life is the choices you make. That's that's the bottom line about your life. Your life is the sum of the decisions you make in your life. And if you you know everyone is the decisions that they make and in, in, in the end. And this is very important because also very important because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want to give you miracles. What I mean is when you say Allah guide me, it doesn't mean Allah give me miracles. Right? Like, I have to pass my exam. So Allah, just you know, guide me and make me pass. Allah doesn't want to pass you, give you a miracle like that. Allah wants you to guide yourself, wants you to have the strength to become the man, to become a human being like Allah made. Allah wants you to work like He wants human beings to work and then surpass whatever difficulties you have, or whatever challenges you have, or whatever opportunities you have. Allah doesn't want to give you miracles. He wants you to work for it based upon knowledge, that's what guidance is. Guidance has, uh, you can say there's four aspects. There's istidara, tawfi, and istiqama, and there are other aspects of guidance. I'm not going to go into that. But the most important thing that I wanted to share with you right now was, ihdina sirat al-mustaqim, Allah guide me to the straight path. The straight, you, so guidance is the choices you make in life. And the number one thing you can do to make the right choices is what? to be with the right people. That's why the next thing you say, 
Sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim. The path of those whom you have favored. Because you are, you are whoever you hang out with, right? So if you think you're going to make right decisions and you can hang out with whatever crowd you want, that's not going to happen, right? You are a uh, Raju, uh, the Prophet وسلم, said uh, uh, something to this statement. It's close to Okama Qala Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A person is on the deen of his friends. A person is on the religion of his friends. So whatever you're hanging out with, so when you want you want to hang out with the people that Allah says, that the best people are the prophets, the Siddiqeen, the Shuhada, the Salihin. Allah says in another place in the Quran, if you want your Iman to increase, very simple trick to increase your Iman, be with the righteous people. Be with good people, your Iman will automatically go up. Be with a group of people, that pray five times a day, automatically you'll start praying five times a day. There's something, you know, internal that transfers. We, uh, in psychology, we call this transference. A good example of transference uh, that I just want to share with you, that we know of, there are two, two examples I'll share with you. One is, you know, you ever seen somebody laugh, a group of people laughing, at, and the, per the other person that comes in, he doesn't even know why you're laughing, but he'll just start laughing. That's transference of emotions. That's transference of little kids. Little kids, when they see other little kids, they'll start crying. Because what happens, especially when you have a clean heart, when you have a clean heart, there's these things, and I'm just explaining this with modern psychology and some of Islam together, but, but what happens is they've discovered we have these things called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons is that other people are able to put, make you feel that this is what empathy is too. Other people are able to put their feelings into you. When there's a baby, and especially if the heart is clean, and it sees another baby crying, the baby will start crying. What happened? The emotions of that child got transferred to this child. That child, the same thing you as parents know this. When your, pa when your child is in pain, right? When your child is in pain, you immediately feel what you you know he, or you think he's going to, you immediately feel his pain, and you react to that. Even though, so, so there's this thing that where emotions get transferred. So, uh, but with, with the children that I just talked about, maybe that's not the best example, but that is an example of empathy though. It's not an example of mere neurons. Uh, but there are many other examples of mere neurons. I'll give you one small example that, because scientists now are not, they used to always study one brain. Right? They're always studying one brain. But now they're studying multiple brains, how they interact with one another. And what they're finding is, is that, for example, if you're having a meeting, right? And how does everybody know that the meeting ended in a meeting? So even if nobody announces the meeting has ended, people just know the meeting has ended. How do you know this? How do we know? So there's some sort of Wi-Fi, mirror neurons, basically. You can look this up on the internet. Mirror neurons are like a Wi-Fi. They work like a Wi-Fi. We don't know exactly how. They're still doing experiments. But there is a type of Wi-Fi that goes on. And that was the example that I was trying to give of transference, where if you, some people are laughing, and the third person comes in, he'll start laughing too, and he won't know what, what the joke even was. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, when you're with righteous people in the same way, when you're with good people, or with when you're bad people, they automatically affect you. So, Sirat al guide me to the path of the people that you have favored. Of course, the people Allah has favored are the prophets, the prophet, his companions, the Islamic history, classical Islamic history, that's there. But when you're saying, guide me to the straight path, you're talking about the here and the now and the concrete. You're talking about this world, in this world, and now. Yes, those, but also here, those that are Allah has guided people here, guide me to them. So, you know that you have to make choices in this life, and you know that to make the right choices, you have to be with the right people. You need a support system. 
if the whole society, if the, you know, if the whole society, the wave of the whole society is going in one direction, and you need to go in the other direction, you can't do it alone. You can't go against the current of the wave alone. You need people around you, people who are like-minded around you, people who have the same feelings as you, people who have the same priorities as you, people who see the world, have your world view. So, اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Allah guide us to the path of the people you have favored. Who are the people Allah has favored? The people that Allah has favored in the past amongst the prophets and their companions, but also Allah has favored many people amongst us to guide us to each other. This is what it is. اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ نَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ The path of those whom you have blessed. Then, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ Not of those whom you are angry over. Now over here I want to share with you, there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet said ﷺ, إِنِّي كَمَا ظَنِّ عَبْدِ عَنِّي I am how my servant thinks I am. Meaning, very important point. Allah said, listen, إِنِّي كَمَا ظَنِّ عَبْدِ عَنِّي إِنِّي كَمَا ظَنِّ عَبْدِ عَنِّي I am as my servant thinks I am. If you think Allah is merciful, He will be merciful. If you think Allah is angry, then Allah will be always angry. So, Don't make me of those people that always Allah's anger is on them. Why is Allah's anger on them? Because Allah is with them as they think Allah is with them. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Because we say Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, but we balance it out with Maliki Open Deep. There's the mercy of Allah, but with the mercy, mercy of Allah is twice. And justice is mentioned once. So Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Open Deep. Then, So Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Open Deep. Allah, I worship none but you and I beg you to help me. You help to help me. I beg you to help me. Then Allah guide me to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, not who you are angry with. Because their own concept of God is convoluted. And this is why the hadith of the Prophet says that Ghayr al Mazubi alayhim is referring to the Yahud. Okay. Nor those that have gone astray. So, what is you're on the path? What is you are on the path, but your concept and your relationship with God has gotten diluted. And one is you've left the path. You're on the path, you're still practicing Islam. Look, the people, you know, uh, this is a good example. There are people. They may have the ability and the opportunity. There are people that are so strict, like for example in their religious behavior, they're so strict because they think Allah is strict. Do you know what I'm saying? They're so strict because they think Allah is strict. Oh, you came to the masjid with your left feet, brother, go out. Right? So kind of like that type of, oh, you didn't put your hands here, you put your hands here. Oh my God, you know, oh my God, you're going to go to hell now, right? You, I'm sure you've all met people like that, that are religious, but their attitude is just so... I don't know what a good word is that I can use as a member. But their attitude is like, so like, you know, you better not make one mistake, otherwise, oh my God, you're such a big sinner. So, <coughs> you want me to use this? Anyway. So the point I'm trying to make is that that's not how Allah wants us to be. See, you see these people in ISIS? That's how they are. They, they are. The Prophet said, by the way, the Prophet said this, do not be so hard on yourself and others that Allah becomes hard on you. This is a hadith of the Prophet. Don't become so hard on yourself and others that Allah makes things hard on you. On you. Because when you will be strict on yourself and especially others, on yourself, to some degree, you have to be strict to yourself. But strict with other people, if you're strict on other people, Allah is going to make things difficult for you. 
You know, the more rules you make and the more, the less flexibility you have and you think everything has to be in a certain way. Not of those, because their concept of Allah, they're, act, they're reacting to their concept of Allah. You see what I'm saying? They're reacting to what they think God is and how God expects them to behave. So, uh, another way to, I won't go into that right now. But light and maldubi alayhim, not of those whom Allah is not, not. Don't make me of those people that are just like so. They they want to follow the straight path, but they have they have it wrong. They're following the path in a way that Allah doesn't like. They have a certain they have a harshness without any mercy. This is how the Prophet actually described it. These are people who have harshness without any mercy. They have harshness, but they have no mercy. So. This is why, you know, um, by the way, just as a side point, I'm telling you that people that study hadith, you have all very much heard probably that the first hadith in most of the hadith books is إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالْنِيَةِ You've all heard this many times. But I'm going to share with you something different. Some of the ulama, the first hadith that they teach students is إِرْحَمْ uh, nas, Have mercy on the people of this world, the one who is in the sky will have mercy on you. Why? Because when you study hadith, it makes your character harsh. When you study hadith, it makes your character what? Hard. Why? Because it gives you all the rules, right? So if you get caught up in all the rules and you don't focus enough on the raqai, then it can have a negative effect. I'm not going to go into that right now, I'm just mentioning it. That sometimes the scholars are aware that if you, because it's like, oh, the Prophet said this, the Prophet said this, how can you not do this, right? So that, and they lose uh, the priority of what is fard and what is sunnah and sunnah ma'ah, they can't, they seem to, when you read hadith, everything is flat, right? Miswak and fard prayers, like there's a chapter in fard prayers and there's a chapter in miswak, they become equal in a sense, every, you, everything you read is flat. So when you read a, a hadith book, you have to be careful you have to know fiqh, kind of, to be able to prioritize the things as you're reading it, to be able to put them in their proper place, because if you don't know fiqh well, and Islamic law well, then when you're reading a hadith book, you'll see everything being flat. And that's going to have a negative effect on a person. I don't know if this helps some of you who have read hadith books, but inshallah, I will continue my second book uh, now. إن الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم so not of those people that you are angry with because they didn't listen to you even though they're on the straight path but either they made a jest oh who cares about what Allah says this is one extreme the other is you yourself became so strict that you think God is has a stick in his hand you became strict and you put that strictness on other people and, did, and so that Allah doesn't like that either both of these are on غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَبْضَالِينَ Those who went astray. They were on the straight path, but they took an exit out. They went out of the straight path. Then there are those people, you know the straight path is very wide. Sirat al-Mustaqim is not narrow. There is a narrow path. Meaning if you want to try to do ihsan and perfection, and you want to do all the fasting and tahajjud, you, you have that choice. As long as you don't force it on others. If you want to be strict to yourself, you can be. That's why what you say in, well anyway, so the straight path is wide. And those people that try to narrow the straight path, narrow the straight path. Sometimes nowadays there's even times where it's like me and my sheikh are going to Jannah. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> I'm sure you've all seen that attitude too, too. Like me and my his my party, we're going to Jannah and I don't know what the, what the other... This is what ISIS is like, right? It's like we're right and everybody else is wrong. And if you don't agree with us, then, you know, 
That's what ISIS is. So that's the problem. That's the, we make the straight path very narrow. This is wrong. And the other, the straight path is very open. Very open. Anyway, so I was saying that we have to beg Allah, beg Allah, beg Allah, beg Allah, that we make, that Allah, we can't, because how are choices, you know, if you want to analyze this a little bit more, I'll just do it just very quickly. Thoughts, <coughs> you know, um, Descartes said, I, I am because I think I am. You ever heard of that? I am because, well, that's completely wrong, because what you think is not in your control. It's random. You don't control your thought. You don't control your thoughts. So how can you say, I, I, I am because I think I am? Your thought is not in your control to be able to say that statement. That statement itself is faulty. But that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm trying to make is exactly the critique of it, which is that thoughts come to your mind, what? Randomly. Thoughts come to your mind randomly. You don't control the thoughts necessarily how they come to your mind. So if you're going to make choices, which has to do with guidance, they're not in your control. Your guidance is not in your control. Your guidance is not in your control. You know, somebody, like just a very simple example, even for a religious person, even for a religious person, I have something to do in an emergency right now. I think, okay, I'll pray. I have two choices. I, let's say I'm in an emergency. I can say I'm going to pray my Lord and also right now together. Or I'll say I'll delay it, right? We always do this. We have to make a choice. I will I pray it now? Will I pray it later? These are all matters. Then what happens? Then we find out, oh, I missed my prayer. Or I'm late for my prayer. Right? So the, even these, we are. We need to beg. The attitude is we need to beg Allah for guidance. Because what comes into your head is not up to you. Thoughts are random. I, the choices we make are based upon you know, they're not always straightforward. There are random thoughts that come to us. So we need to beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us. Inshallah, on that we will end. Let's do dua and then we will pray. Rabbana atina fil dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina azab al-na Rabbana ghulamna hasana wa illam tawfil lana wa tarhamna lana kunna min al-khasirin Rabbana taj'al khilafat al-muslimin bihadhi al-ard اللهم ألهمنا رشدنا وعزنا من شهور أنفسنا اللهم ألهمنا أنفسنا وعزنا من شهور أنفسنا اللهم تجعل القرآن ربيع قلوبنا اللهم يا رب العالمين in this Eid help us to really get closer to our family members and forgive all our sins with each other and then اللهم أمين اللهم صلي على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد آمين إن الله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد إن الله يعمر بالأذل والإحسان وإداء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيذكم لعلكم تذكرون والله يكفيكم فإن لم تبقوا في الصلاة